Okay, th thank you all very much for coming um, to tonight. I, uh, I want to, a, a, lot of the, a lot of the themes that I was gonna talk about were, were touched on in the introduction, so that's always, that's always good, but I wanted to, I think I should start with this one phrase that Isabel used, which was the, an ontological challenge. Uh, so Hades, Hades' existence, as an independent republic is and always has been from its, from its creation uh, a challenge to every force in the world that wants to impose its will on smaller and weaker countries. It's always been a challenge to those who would seek to impose colonialism, to those who would seek to impose slavery. And that that challenge has been, it was posed by the, the Haitian Revolution itself. So this is, this is something, and again, I, I, know, I know a lot of you in, that, are, that are sitting here, I, I've actually cited at least four or five of you in the book, so, so I'm, I'm telling some of you things that you know, but, it's, but a lot of this story is, is worth repeating. When, when you learn in school about the American Revolution, you learn in school about the French Revolution, but we don't actually learn about the most important revolution that was happening at the same time as these two, which was Haiti. Because France had a revolution and continued to sponsor slavery and colonialism. The United States had a revolution uh, to free themselves from Britain, but then proceeded to uh, enact a genocide against native people uh, in the continent and also continued to hold slaves until they had a civil war 60, 70 years later. So, but Haiti actually had a revolution that was based on those ideals of liberty and equality and, and fr what they called fraternity, um, which we would today call solidarity, I think. Uh, but they took that, those ideals far more seriously they took them so seriously that they overthrew slavery on the island, that they fought every colonial power at the time. They fought the French, they fought the Spanish, they fought the English. And they made alliances and they, and they freed themselves against unbelievable odds. And, and that, was a, that was a message to the world. The message to the world was that as long as Haiti exists, there will always be a challenge to slavery. There will always be a challenge to colonialism. And it was a, a conscious, conscious, you know, conscious of, of race, conscious of class. It was a conscious revolution that they, that they posed. And that consciousness has never gone away. That consciousness continues to motivate Haitians today. And that's, you can't really understand all of the all of the vindictiveness that has been shown towards Haiti over these, over these hundreds of years without understanding the challenge that Haiti poses to the principal powers of the world at the time and also today. When Haiti became independent, it was a slave economy. It was a slave economy that was based on sugar plantations. It was, it was brought forcibly into the world market by, into, into a chain of, of exporting sugar to, to Europe, to North America, and to other places. But that economy couldn't just be turned around. So despite the fact that Haiti had won its independence by force of arms and through the revolution, they couldn't simultaneously change the, the relationship that Haiti had to the global economy. No matter how revolutionary their aspirations were, they were stuck with the system that the French had imposed on them. And because they were stuck, they were vulnerable to the global economy, they were vulnerable to the world market, and that made them vulnerable to naval power, to the superior naval power of the, Fr of the French and of the United States. Um, that vulnerability enabled France to enact a blockade against Haiti, to threaten to blockade Haiti, unless Haiti paid for its independence. Again, I know this is a story that people um, might know, but it's, it's 
fresh. It's relevant. It, it's 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 being lived right now. This this thing that happened 200 years ago. France imposed an indemnity of 150 million francs of then francs at that time on Haiti for the for the price of the property that the French lost during the revolution. The property that they lost during the revolution was the slaves themselves. The slaves who had become free had been property and became human beings. They had to pay in addition to having to pay in blood and 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 fight. Um, they also had to pay this indemnity, which they didn't finish paying for another 130 or more years. So while the, the powerful countries were having their industrial revolutions, while the United States and Canada and the countries of Europe were having their, were leaping into the new industrial economy, Haiti was paying every scrap of surplus that they could raise to pay for this indemnity for decades and decades and decades. That was not, that was not broken up, that was not then stopped or, or reversed. In, instead, at around the same time that Haiti was close to finishing paying its indemnity, the United States invaded Haiti again. So the Marines invaded Haiti. At, this was at a time when the United States was enacting this new doctrine that they had, which was that all things in Latin America and the Middle East, eventually, would be under their jurisdiction. They wouldn't accept any of the old colonial powers. So to show this, they invaded uh, Nicaragua, they invaded the Dominican Republic, they invaded Haiti in, in, in around this period. And they stayed in Haiti for about 20 years, from 19, I think 15 to 1934. And they, or, they reorganized the army, they reorganized the banks, they set up a system, which had already been in their favor, but they set up various elements of the system to, to ensure their control over the key aspects of the country that would make sure that these were the levers of power for them. The, the military, the finances, the, the politics. And once you control what those three elements of, are, are the elements of control in a society. If you don't have control over your finances, your politics, or your, the armed force, then you are not a sovereign. You're not a sovereign country. Um, so that was that was the reorganization that, that the United States left in 1934. Not too long after, well, World War II, but not too long after that was the Cold War. And during the Cold War, the United States supported a series of dictatorships throughout the world, in Asia, in Africa, in, in Latin America. And one of these was the Haitian dictators, the Duvalier. And the, the Duvalier dictators were your classic dictators. They had a cult of personality around them. You would see their picture everywhere. You would see their, their, they would delegate patronage power through a series of section chiefs. They had a terror organization devoted to terrorizing people, the Tonton Makut. And they had their prisoners. They had their muzzling of the press. They, they squashed all freedom of expression and, and freedom of press. So they did all this. And they were, oh, and of course, as dictators, as your classic Cold War dictators, they also stole billions of dollars and secreted it away to Swiss bank accounts and, and properties elsewhere in the world. That was the, the struggle against the dictators is, is a key story. Um, that, that again, like the indemnity, like the struggle against slavery, like the challenge posed by Haiti, like the imposition of colonialism of the states, is fresh. It's fresh and it's being lived as we speak in Haiti. There, there was a struggle, this is, this is documented in a, a, the greatest book on this period to my mind is Peter Halward's Damning the Flood, where he, he talks about the rise of this democratic movement uh, which which was which arose in in response to the Duvalier dictators. They they arose. It, this movement arose as a as a struggle 
for democracy, really. It was, a, it was a struggle for democracy. It was a struggle against the economic model of the Duvalier, which was based on doing everything to please the, the imperial, the external powers, and, and steal uh, for, the, for, the, for the rulers. The, so the, the revolt, or the, the democratic movement that arose had a lot of different elements. It was, it came from the base of society. It came from the poor people that were suffering from the dictators. Most of the society was poor for all of the reasons that I've already mentioned. But it, and it also had, the, the church played a role. Like in Central America at the time, the church, the liberation theology, there was a concept for, of the preferential option for the poor, which a lot of Catholic priests in Latin America were, were going in for at the time. And one of, one of, those, one of those priests was Jean-Bertrand Aristide, who, who coined the term Lavalas. So Lavalas was, is Creole for the word flood. So it's, the idea was any individual drop doesn't, may not amount to very much, but when all the drops come together, they can form a flood. And that was the principle of a, of a democratic movement. If, if all of these little drops come together, they could sweep away the dictatorship and they could sweep away all of these impositions on the people. That was like the revolution itself, that idea is something that had to be punished. Uh, it was punished throughout Latin America. The Central American Wars that happened in the 19, late 70s and 80s could be viewed as punishment for a, a democratic upsurge, for, for people's democratic will. And, and in Haiti, it was no different. There was, there was a long struggle that Lavalas had with the Duvalier dictators with their terror apparatus, with the Haitian army. And they, use, they, they used popular organization, they used demonstrations, they used every kind of communication strategy, and they, they won. I mean, they, they eventually won at, at great cost. Like, like the Haitian Revolution, they also paid a terrible price for it. Um, Amy Wylance, who... Uh, who's I don't always agree with, but she wrote a great book on this exact period when Lavalas was, was having their initial struggle with the Duvalier called The Rainy Season, which I still completely recommend. Um, so in this period, they struggled and they eventually won. They won actually sooner than they thought they would. There was an election which, which was continually postponed for years, a little bit like... Egypt was after, after they overthrew Mubarak a, a little while ago. Um, but eventually there was an election and, and Lavalas and Aristide won, which was a real surprise to everybody. Um, and yet it wasn't much of a surprise because they actually had a program that spoke to the masses of people and they, so it, as a, as in a democratic sense, it was no surprise. They were the only people who spoke for the majority. And so it shouldn't have been a surprise. And yet, they weren't ready uh, in a lot of ways. And Democratic or Lavalas activists have told me this, how they, they were a little bit taken aback by their own success uh, at, at the time. And they, it, wasn't a, it wasn't a permanent entrenched success because they were actually very quickly overthrown again. And, and Aristide was forced into exile in the United States. In, for the next three years, a series of generals ruled Haiti with sponsorship from the U.S. while Aristide was trying to negotiate uh, to get back. So there was this whole process in which Air, the United States was offering to let Aristide go back and rein the generals in, provided that he changed the key elements of his program. So the reason that Lavalas's program was so popular was because it was democratic, but also, crucially, it was because of the economic aspect. And the economic aspect wasn't some kind of unrealistic, crazy dream. The economic aspect was Lavalas's economic program 
was encapsulated in one phrase. They wanted to raise Haitians from absolute misery to poverty with dignity. That was Lavalas' dream. That was the program that the United States opposed. That was the program that they made Aristide basically promise not to enact as a condition of letting him back in the country. And so by the time he did come back at the, uh, in 1994, 1994 or 5, he was, he was, he was asked, he, he, pro he had promised to not enact all of the reforms that, they, that Lavalas came to power promising. And in the meantime, hundreds and actually thousands of Lavalas activists had been killed and imprisoned and, and the infrastructure of Lavalas on the ground in Haiti was, was systematically dismantled in these three years under a kind of, under generals that were basically sponsored. Some of them were directly CIA sponsored assets and so on. What happened next was something, again, unique, which was a, a peaceful transition of power between one democratic government and another. So Préval, René Préval became the president after winning an election and, and proceeded to be the president for the next five years. This is important because um, some scholars, and I addressed this at the beginning of the book, they said, I, I read in a, in a scholarly book about Haiti that perhaps the natural form of government in Haiti is dictatorship. And I, I thought this was pretty unfair because, in fact, the, the, the story of the last few decades is precisely one of the majority struggling for democracy against external forces of control. In 2000, Aristide ran again and became president again. Um, and, uh, and, was, and, and you had a period now where Aristide was president, finally, uh, had a popular mandate, and could then perhaps had a mandate to enact all of the economic programs that, that everybody had always dreamed that Lavalas was going to do since the late 80s. And at that point, serious efforts began to try to stop Lavalas and get rid of Aristide. So there, were, there was a sponsorship of paramilitaries. People, I think Jeb Sprague was through here. Was he? Did he come to Montreal? Uh, he did a book specifically on paramilitaries in Haiti and the, and the, the role they've played in, in subverting democracy. So there was sponsorship of paramilitary groups on the, on the border with Haiti, like Haiti shares a border with the Dominican Republic. There was organization of what was called civil society. So civil society is all the groups, in political science terms, all the groups that have some independence from the state. So business, the private sector is civil society, non-governmental organizations are civil society. So there was a coordination of all of the civil society elements that were opposed to the government, that were opposed to Aristide and Lamelas, And they started agitating for what they called option zero, which was instead of power sharing, instead of having a new election, which they would probably lose, they had to get rid of Aristide and then, you know, we can talk, but Aristide has to go. The popular leader that was elected has to go. And after that, they were willing, these groups that had tiny followings were willing to negotiate. There was also the, this is important for what's going on today, there was also a, a very specific fomenting and sponsorship of violence in the poor neighborhoods in the form of gangs, or what was called gang violence. Uh, and, and this was done, there's a, there's a report that came out shortly, I mean in 2004, uh, by at the University of Miami, and they, they interviewed a lot of people in these, in these neighborhoods who described connections between wealthy members of the opposition and gang leaders. So the, these members of the opposition, like and, and Andy Apade and Reginald Bulos, they had meetings with gang leaders, and they, who knows what happened in the meetings, but after the meetings, these leaders would go out and kill people in the in the in their neighborhoods that were 
associated with Lavalas. And there were shooting battles. So the, at some times, the Lavalas associated people would shoot back. And so you got what, what was then called a gang war in the slums, which, which the government could then be blamed for. So that was key. The, the ability to create a, a situation where people were shooting at each other and you could then blame the elected government for the violence was a part of the overthrow, was the part of justifying the overthrow of the, of the government at the time. So you had these, this gang thing that was going on that was very deliberately sponsored and created by wealthy patrons. You had paramilitaries also being externally financed and, and, and supported by the United States in the Dominican Republic. You had the political coordination and the media coordination. Actually, Isabel, who just introduced me, did a thesis about the coordination of the media aspects of the overthrow of the government. And, and they were quite proud of the role that they, they played. In fact, they, they described it with a lot of pride, the, that they helped coordinate um, that they helped coordinate demonstrations, they helped describe the they helped they described the demonstrations as being bigger than they were against the government and, and so on. All to all with a view of all with a view to eventually overthrowing the regime. None of this though would have been enough. None of this would have worked. This was not a strong movement, even though there were all of these elements. With all of the coordinated non-governmental organizations, all of the outrageous media stories that were being told on the ground in Haiti, with all of the paramilitaries and their weapons, they were still a tiny sliver of society. And the vast majority still supported the government. And so the key, the absolute key element here was the external intervention in 2004. It was the US, it was Canada, and it was France. And without those, without those powers, the, the coup would not have happened. The, the government would not have been, a, been overthrown. In fact, there's, there was, the government was looking for ways of dealing with these various forces. Among the ways they were hoping to deal with it was, I mean, and I know, I know in, this, in this crowd, those of us who do a lot of demonstrations and, and go out on the streets to protest things are not big fans of police and riot gear and tear gas, but that's what the government of Haiti was looking for. They were looking for non-lethals so that they could, uh, so that they could, they could try to deal with the opposition demonstrations. Those were on their way. The, the South African government and the Venezuelans were, had shipped uh, these, these supplies to the Haitian government. They hadn't arrived. They were set to arrive when the United States kidnapped Aristide. So the United States showed up at Aristide's house. The ambassador showed up at Aristide's house in the middle of the night, took him on a plane to the Central African Republic. And this story... Is, is actually really well told by Randall Robinson. Randall Robinson wrote a book called the, uh, An Unbroken Agony. And he, he can tell this story because he went to the Central African Republic basically on a rescue operation. Randall Robinson, Amy Goodman, and some other journalists went to the Central African Republic and basically said, we're not going to leave here without Aristide. Because Aristide was held as a prisoner there. He, I mean, the Central African Republic um, is beholden to France and to, to, the, to the great powers for a wide range of things. In fact, when Randall Robinson went with, uh, with Amy Goodman, but also, I think, it, it, Maxine Waters, I think, one of, the, one of the U.S. Congress, one of the members of the U.S. Congress, and she, she went into a meeting with the president of, this is described in Unbroken Agony, she went into a meeting with the president, and he said, yeah, well, you know, we can release Aristide, but do you think you could help us with the World Bank? We, you could help us with a World Bank loan? So it was literally like a, a, some kind of give and take that was going on. Uh, you hold on to this prisoner for us and we'll, we'll get you something. So, so the idea, okay. So all of this, 
all of this context is, is particularly important when you look at the reasons why the United States, I mean the United Nations, says they were, they're there today. So think about what a, a UN mandate is. So the United Nations has a, man, a peacekeeping mandate. Peacekeeping, in theory, is supposed to be when, a, when the United Nations goes into a civil war situation, forces the, the factions to stop fighting, forces them to sit down and negotiate a, some kind of settlement, and, the, and then oversees the peace. That's the theory behind peacekeeping. The, the situation in Haiti did not fit that at any point. There wasn't a civil war situation. There was a popular government and various attempts to overthrow it, and then there was a kidnapped government and a complete vacuum which was created by the powers that, that took the president out. In that vacuum, the United Nations stepped in and said, okay, we'll step in and we'll govern, essentially. They, they sponsored what they called an interim government, but really the, the UN peacekeeping mission in Haiti never made sense in terms of a peacekeeping mandate. When I went there in 2005 and talked to officials from the UN Stabilization Mission and the police mission uh, and the disarmament program, we asked them, what are you doing here? What is, what is this about? It, I don't, given that there's not a civil war situation, given that even now the government that's been installed doesn't really have any armed opposition to it. There's no, Lavalas is not out there fighting some kind of guerrilla war against the interim government. What is the, what is the need for a chapter seven armed United Nations mandate here? And they said, gangs. They said, we're here to fight against gang violence. And the thing about gang violence in Haiti is that it's not as bad as many other countries. It's not as bad as Jamaica, it's not as bad as Honduras, it's not as bad as Brazil. Which is, and the craziest thing about that is Brazil is occupying Haiti right now, fighting gangs. Um, so the, 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 I, the pretexts for what the UN is doing don't hold. The, the first excuse that it's, it's a peacekeeping mission doesn't make sense and never did. The idea that it's an anti-gang mission also doesn't make sense. And so the, the governance of Haiti today is now this very strange international multilateral creation that was, that was both planned and also, I think, improvised. And everybody that's in Haiti today has a different interest in, in what they're doing. And none of them are thinking about Haiti. None of them have Haiti in mind at all. And that was, that's by design. And it's quite a feat. It's quite a feat to be able to get every country in the world to occupy a, another, another country. And for, all, for every different reason, none of whom have any interest in that country. If you look at a map, if you go on MINUSTA, MINUSTA is the UN stabilization mission for Haiti. If you go on, on, if you go on MINUSTA's website and you look at a map, you can see the, part, the way that the country is partitioned. There are Sri Lankans in one corner, there are Nepalis in one corner, there's Indians and Pakistanis together, which is rare enough to see in the world, but in Haiti they manage to get along, which is great. Um, you have Chileans, Uruguayans, you have the overall command by the Brazilians. And the, 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 the map is kind of a map of, of national humiliation for Haiti. I mean, the, I, I talked to Haitians last year, I was there last year as well, and I talked to this politician, and he said, you know, <laughs> he said every country is, he said, you know, Brazil's in Haiti, good for Brazil. Brazil, want, Brazil has something to prove to the world, that's fine, good for them. Sri Lanka's in Haiti, good for Sri Lanka, but it's time for Haiti, Haiti should get a chance to think of Haiti, too, and, and none of these countries are in Haiti for Haiti. So what happens? What happens as a result 
of a country being governed by those who have no interest in it. What happens is that every kind of disaster, every kind of natural event, every kind of economic event becomes measurably more deadly in terms of lives, in terms of physical lives that are lost. So Isabel mentioned vulnerability, right? So natural disasters, academics who study natural disasters talk about vulner talk, they talk about the, the natural hazard and then and the vulnerability. Those two elements have to come come together to create a natural disaster. So the earthquake was a natural disaster where the hazard aspect of it, the geological aspect of it, was not as bad as many earthquakes that happened around the same time. Like China had one, Chile had one around the same time. Hades killed tens of thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of people, because the infrastructure was so poor, because the relief efforts were so disorganized because there's no national, there's no concept of national planning. There's no, there's no national planning on the horizon. There's no, there's no, I, no one in the world even thinks national planning is, is something that is, is good for, that might be good for Haitians. They, they, they all think it's good enough for them during a disaster, but not for Haitians. So many more people died. I'm prepared to argue that. Many, many more people died in Haiti because of the way Haiti's governed than would have died under a sovereign kind of government that was where Haiti was under control of, of Haitians. The cholera epidemic was brought by the United Nations. It was, cholera was not known in Haiti until the United Nations came, brought it. And, the, and cholera was it, there's extensive studies. Every public health researcher that studied it has said this is, it came from this place. It came from these soldiers from Nepal. It's the Nepalese strain. It went into the river here. It got into the drinking water supply because of all of these infrastructural considerations. And, and they, but they qualify it. So maybe two, three weeks ago, there was a, the latest report, the most conclusive study showing that cholera came from the UN. And they said, came from the UN, but it's, no, it's nobody's fault. It's nobody's fault, really. Nobody's to blame. And in a way, in a really perverse way, that's actually true. The way Haiti is governed today, it's governed in a way that thousands of people can die of a preventable disease that's been brought by the, the rulers of the country, and nobody's to blame. Because the United Nations subcontracted the handling of their waste, the subcontractor mishandled the waste, the, in, the water infrastructure up or downstream was not where it should have been, it was not up to code, and people were drinking from it when they weren't supposed to, and so it goes on and on, and nobody's to blame, and you know, 7,500 people, 7,600 people are dead, 6% of the population is affected, and nobody's to blame. So, the, the reason, this, this kind of brings me to a, a, an, an explanation of the title. The title of the book is Haiti's New Dictatorship. And I'm not talking about the current government that was sort of elected in 2011. Uh, I say sort of elected precisely because there's tremendous external influence on the electoral process in Haiti as well. The US Embassy gets involved. Uh, the OAS gets involved. They tell them who the candidates can be and not. They're, there's back channels to the electoral authority. And the electoral authority, of course, banned a wide range of parties from running in that election. There was lower turnout than there's been in elections in a long time. And that government has, Mar Michel Martelly is the president's name, they've had a an incredibly hard time getting their act, getting, getting organized to do anything, which is not to say that it would be better if they could get organized to do something, because they're not, the, the composition of that government is of people who were 
supportive of the Duvalier, and and there's a they 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 hate there there's a lot of contempt and and um, yeah contempt and hostility towards the democratic movement and towards the whole history of Haiti and, and Lavalas that that the current government I think shows. So, but having said that, the the current government was elected in elections that that had tremendous external interference. And so the electoral process isn't a sovereign one. The streets are being patrolled by this multilateral intervention force from all over the world. The budget is controlled by donors. There, there, there is a Haiti Reconstruction Commission that has that have, that's generously allowed some Haitian members on the board, um, as well as the donors. The Haitian members have actually walked out at multiple times to protest the fact that nobody was listening to any of their priorities. But even if they were, a lot of the, what's gone on, in terms of the relief, in terms of the reconstruction, has had, again, nothing to do with Haiti. It's had everything to do with the donors. And you can look at, look at the numbers. In, in, at the end of the book, I did an interview with an anthropologist named Tim Schwartz. He's got a, an amazing book called Travesty in Haiti. It's, it's, it's quite a remarkable set of stories that he tells from him living in Haiti for the past few decades between Haiti and the Democratic, I mean, the Dominican Republic. And Schwartz does a back of the envelope calculation where he shows how if there are a few thousand non-governmental organizations in Haiti doing reconstruction work, they all get a per diem of a hundred or a couple hundred dollars a day. For every two or three of them, there's a driver that charges 50 or 100 a day. That, before you touch a Haitian, before a Haitian gets a glass of water or, or a handful of flour, you've spent $700 million. And so, so you're wondering where the billions of dollars went. There's a documentary, I think, called Haiti, Where Did the Money Go?, which is really good. Uh, but, but you're wondering where they went. You, can ju you don't even need data to figure out. You just look around at who, where the money is, you could, at who's got money in Haiti. And it's a bunch of people from the donor countries. So finances, armed force, elect the political system and the electoral system all in foreign hands. Impunity. When, when the United Nations brings cholera and thousands of people die, nobody gets punished, nobody gets blamed. When United Nations soldiers commit sexual abuse against children in Haiti, which they've done, in some cases recorded video is, is available for people to see, that's, um, that's impunity. That's not, how is that different? I mean, maybe it's different, but in important ways, it's the same as the, di the old dictatorships. There's not the same kind of smothering of free expression, but there is an, an advanced propaganda machine justifying all of this. And that propaganda machine reaches people that, that should know better, <laughs> I think. And that, that was, that's another part of this story, is the pres presentation of Haiti as some kind of international internationally unique basket case that needs to be put under external control because of the corruption and for the good of its own people. Well, the corruption is in the international regime that's governing Haiti. The biggest wastes of money, the biggest tragedies of, of recon failure to, re to rebuild or provide relief have happened under, on the watch of the international regime that's governed Haiti. Worse, vastly worse human rights abuses have occurred under the watch of the international regime governing, ha governing Haiti than under the government that it overthrew. So the, the, it's, all, it's all false. It's, it's a pre the presentation is an inversion of reality. The, the corruption, the anti-democratic anti, anti forces are, are the ones that are invoking corruption and, and human rights as a, as a pretext.
this isn't inevitable, right? So it's, it's important to, to remember that all of this was done in order to suppress democratic, a, a democratic upsurge and a democratic movement. This is not something, again, it's important to remember this because the story goes that the international community has to be in Haiti to help. And, and if the international community were to leave, there would be some kind of awful disaster. In fact, the international community went into Haiti to hurt the democratic movement. That's why they went. They removed the president. They took over the country. And they proceeded over the slaughter of and the dismantling of the democratic movement. The leaders were put in prison under their watch. Hundreds of people were raped and killed on their watch. Thousands. Yeah, yeah, thousands. And, and, and it documented in, you know, documented across the board by human rights organizations in public health studies. There was a Lancet study, uh, the, you know, published in health journals. So there's, there's the evidence is there that the, that the international community, when they are allowed, when they are given the chance to rule a country, do immeasurably worse, or measurably worse, actually, than, than the, the government, than a sovereign democratic government. So, you know, some people ask, I don't know, we, we, can, we can talk about this during discussion, but people ask, what does that mean in terms of helping Haiti? What does that mean in terms of people here who, who hear these arguments, who hear this history? What does it mean if you want to help Haiti? Well, it means that help, if you want to help Haiti, you have to consider sovereignty as a criteria. You have to consider whether the help is actually helping the country to become to become more in to reclaim its independence or whether it's destroying and undermining that, that independence. And there are examples. So the Venezuelans, the Cubans, there's the way they've been doing things in Haiti has been government to government. It's been it's been very deliberately attempting to build capacity to subsidize energy, obviously Venezuela, that's Venezuela, been Venezuelan's role. And, and, and there are specific groups, right? There are, there are groups in the camps, people, a lot of, hundreds of thousands of people have been living in camps since the earthquake. They're, they've organized themselves in the camps. There are people's organizations and popular organizations, and, and, the, and Haiti Action has connections to those and relationships that, that if you want to plug into and if you want to do that kind of work and help, there are definitely ways. But you have to consider sovereignty and you have to, you have to start from a place that understands that, that the story of the Haitian the, the corrupt Haitian government that needs the international community to, to come in is a, is a lie. And it's the worst kind of lie. It's a, it's a self-justifying lie. And, and it's one of these lies that's, that's designed as a part of, the camp, the, of this centuries-long campaign to squash that challenge that Haiti poses. And it, it hasn't been squashed, and it's not going to be squashed, and so it's important to get on to the right side of that, uh, the, which, is, which is the side of the, of the Haitian Revolution, I think. So I'll stop there, and, and we'll take questions. All right, so thank you so much, Justin. And we're going to, we're going to have a chance now for questions. On va maintenant prendre des questions. Si vous voulez les poser en français, vous êtes invité de, um, de faire ça. I don't, we don't have a mic, so I would just encourage people. If, does anybody have a question out here? Yeah. Four or five years ago, I saw a film 